um, Yuan will be talking about crisis that occurs to students after they get to their university abroad, and Joan will be talking about a case study today. Sample crisis. In 2017, we faced one of Nepal's worst natural disasters, which I'm going to be talking about in detail in a little while. But basically, earthquake can be a major source of crisis. Not just the disaster itself, but also what happens after the disaster. Economic crisis. For example, in our country, especially our region here, um, the dollar might suddenly go up, and family savings, therefore, depreciate significantly. Economic can also be, for example, a blockade that happens after a natural disaster where no one has access to the basic necessities, such as cooking gas, or such as electricity, or water. These are forms of economic crisis. Political crisis. <coughs> in 2001, in Nepal, almost our entire royal family was wiped out, plunging the nation into crisis. Political crisis doesn't have to be within our own countries. It can be political issues that are happening globally, and therefore student perceptions of how welcome they are in certain countries. Admissions-related crisis. Many things can happen. Bad things can happen during the admissions process itself. As you can probably tell, I'm speaking from experience. Our Nepali students have experienced all of the above. And in a crisis situation, it's often us, advisors, we, guidance counselors, that are the first point of resource, the first point of comfort for a crisis-affected student. We should be prepared to help. <coughs> I'm no crisis management expert. I only have some experience. But in my opinion, if it is at all possible, if it's possible, we should try to be prepared for crisis. We should try to plan. About a year or two before the earthquake hit, all over the media, there was constant reminder, earthquake is coming, earthquake is coming. Every 70 years, an earthquake, a big earthquake, hits Nepal. Well, we can't really protect a student from a building that falls on them, but what we can do is protect a student from a bookshelf that falls on them. And we can do our best in this simple situation, to bolt the bookshelves onto the wall. That is crisis um, preparation. That's exactly what we did a year or two before the earthquake. After the earthquake hit, none of the books fell off the shelves. It was, it was one form of um, crisis preparation. When crisis hit, what do we do? We avoid panic. We try to identify the crisis. What is the crisis? Define it, identify it, and try our best, even though the crisis might be ongoing, to uh, look at its impact and find out its scale. It might not be so easy to do so. We're going to have an example in a while. We might not be able to solve the crisis single-handedly, but we can do something, one small thing, one tiny thing. That can help the students who are affected by the crisis. Again, we're going to have an example. I think the next step is to communicate the crisis out. Put it out there. As long as it's not something that is um, particular to that uh, student, not something confidential, we should communicate to our networks about the crisis. We should seek help. We should delegate. Try to break it down. You take this piece, I'll take this piece. Somebody else takes another piece, and we try to help. We work collaboratively. We work calmly. And after the crisis, after the crisis is blown over, we have a time to catch our breath, and that's when we can prepare for the next crisis, right? Looking back <laughs> on our experience, we can say, well, this is what we did really well. This is what we could have done better. Next time the same crisis happens or something similar, we know what to do. We're going to be more mentally prepared. So as I said, 2017, earthquakes two major earthquakes hit in spring of 2017. We planned as best we could. We had staff meetings about earthquakes. We equipped our centers with earth earthquake alarms and, of course, did our basics for, um, for protecting students um, in terms of falling bookshelves and, and furniture. So then it happened. 
2017, April. 25, 2017, um, more than 7.8 on the Richter scale, and this is what various parts of the country look like. I was actually not in Nepal for this crisis. I was here in India during the time of crisis, and I was dealing with a personal crisis in my family where um, someone was undergoing medical treatment here in India, but I felt the earthquake. I was on the 12th floor, the 14th floor of a very large hospital complex and I thought that was it. I thought we were the epicenter there in Delhi. I thought that was it. Then I turned on the news after the shaking stop. And I realized, oh, it's not India. It's not even Afghanistan that was initially reported. It's Nepal. And my heart dropped. I remember the feeling. My heart dropped. Because my entire family was in Nepal. All my students were in Nepal. Everyone was in Nepal. And this was crisis. And what I did is I watched and I waited. There was no point in freaking out. It doesn't solve any problems. And I waited. For a day, for a two days, I realized this is a big crisis. Initially when crisis hits, we don't get the scale immediately. But it became very evident over the next couple of days that 9,000 people would have perished. That thousands have become homeless. What could I do to help in this situation? Sitting there, in a hospital on the outskirts of Delhi. I got online. That was a luxury that most students who were in Nepal at the time did not have. I got online and I put a call out to US University colleagues. And I said, look everyone, we are in day four of the earthquakes that hit Nepal. The May 1st deadline was literally around the corner. So the, the first earthquake happened April 25, the May 1st notification deadline was literally five or six days away. I did my best, my one small thing, to notify the entire USHEI community that look, this has happened. Our students need a little bit of grace time. Please, if they contact you after the May 1st notification deadline, it's probably because they did not have internet access. It's probably because their entire family has shifted out into the tent on the big field and are experiencing these crazy aftershocks that actually went a year after the major earthquake. So we did it. I communicated with this message. Some of you might remember it from the various um, the groups uh, all over online. Um, and I sought help. I couldn't do it on my own. I didn't have access to all the groups. So I sought help from colleagues in the HEI community, from other NUSA advisors, and so on, and I made sure that this message got as far and as wide as possible. That was my one small thing that I could do to help. Unfortunately, another earthquake hit um, a couple of weeks later in May, um, and it was almost as big. And at that point, we had experienced so many aftershocks. We're experienced now. And I still found myself in India, and I still found Delhi was shaking, especially on the 14th floor. It was shaking a lot, and I got on, on the phone with my colleagues while it was still shaking, and I realized, and I was reassured by the calm in their voices, that even though they were administering an exam for a group of students in an auditorium in our center, they were calmly able to evacuate. And I could, I could feel such a reassurance um, on the phone with them while it was still shaking. After the earthquakes, after everything was over, we had more meetings. We were able to discuss more and to be more prepared for the next time. Having experience is so priceless. I am now going to uh, hand over to my colleague, Yuan, who is going to talk about crisis during university. <coughs> Thank you, Selena, for such a beautiful, informative introduction. Um, a salami in Japan, an earthquake in Nepal, ongoing conflict in Syria and Yemen. Um, when emergency strikes, um, the victims' lives affected, including education. Um, we're standing uh, before um, John and um, Selena, who helped more than 80 Napoli students um, and changed their lives. 
when we spoke with、um, the cases、uh, on campus, no matter when we advocate for more fundings or for more support、uh, on campus or off campus in our communities, all we heard is, "If I can see both of them, give our salute." So. On behalf of、um, our faculty、um, and the students you helped, and、um, the entire international community, we salute to both of you. Thank you. The crisis、um, on our campuses. I'm sure you can speak so much more than、um, what I would share. I'll share a couple of stories.、Um, I representing、uh, Stony Brook University、uh, Public Institution on Long Island, New York, and um, um, I'm I'm here also to thank you for. On the other end, who、um, each one of you sent the students to us because it's a joint effort and it's collective responsibility to help the student to have as positive experience as they can on campus. I always feel if、um, if we all look not from the mission point of view, but from a human in and from、uh, the Best interests of students. No crisis、um, will be not unsolved. So, when students coming to a different culture and different、um, setting, the challenges for many. For example,、uh, language is the first thing. We welcomed our students at、uh, orientation, and no matter during an undergraduate, a graduate, or even we have a language. Uh, center. So a couple months later, one of our students came back and to ask for help, and he could not really express that well. And、uh, and I said, "Your English is not getting any better." And he said, "Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you." And so he's not getting the language passed.、Um, To that barrier yet to be into able to integrate it, and speaking of language,、um, another student,、uh, a girlfriend and boyfriend had fight, and so、um, the boyfriend somehow just hit the girlfriend, and you know it's absolutely not tolerated. So police came and asked the girlfriend if she need、uh, protection. Is that she said yes, yes. But she did not understand the culture and the legal part and the language. That means that she、um, is no longer that day until the period of time that she released that statement. That the boyfriend will be in a retention room for a while. So I visit the boyfriend, and he was all in tears, and he said, "I didn't mean that." And then before I went, I talked to the girlfriend. She said, "I want him back." But then, <laughs> so the culture and the language are the beginning of the journey for our students to start.、Um, and also, some of the、um, beliefs in our students. For example,、um, some of the Uh, personal conflict.、Um, if they did not resolve on the level of individual、uh, conversation, and they、um, elevated to a different level、um, between get into political. Some between North Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, China, or even India to Pakistan. So. When two roommates had fight,、um, they were back and forth,、um, had many、um, verbal and email or text message. So the one student te- tell the her roommate,、um, "I have the whole 
1.2 million people behind me if you are doing this, this, this. And the next message is, if you're doing this, I'll put you in a dryer. So those threatened words also are also very, um, very dangerous for uh, campuses. And so how we educate our students and work together collectively with our campus to educate our students um, in the conflict when they are occurred, how to resolve that from personal to national to political. And uh, also our um, students, when they come and they may have many preceded, and preceded um, um, financial uh, issues. One of our students who are in the third year biomechanical engineering and grandmother had stage four cancer um, and he just had <coughs> two semesters left and uh, he was um, 3.8 GPA, Dean's List and presence. And so um, our policy uh, might be different but to help the students, we, um, we helped him through graduation and he was able to do some wonderful things to um, his country and to, to the community. Um, we may have our own policies, but when we look at it, it's each individual student's uh, human being that, that it matters. And uh, we also work not only through our campuses, each um, department, but we also work closely with our community. Um, for example, the Rotary um, Club, local Rotary Club, step up when one of our students, uh, full scholarship students, were not able to pay the income tax for, they need to file the income tax, that $2,000. The first year we helped, my husband and I helped, but the second year, for some reason, it was delayed, not refund. So um, we work with the local, local Rotary Club and they came to help um, the student able to uh, resolve the issue. And um, another, um, another example is we work with um, other charity organizations for someone um, was displaced scholar that were not able to have um, um, other fundings. Uh, we were able to give um, him a, a card, a credit card, and have $350 for the transportation meal every month automatically put on the card so that he doesn't have to worry about the next meal and he doesn't have to know who gave it to him. It's anonymous. Um, so we have been working with our community and helped our students um, in whatever way we can. We work with our faculties and many of our faculties are, um, are excellent and one third of our faculty and staff are foreign born like you and me were not born in U.S. Um, however, um, when students issue, we, we helped um, not only academic one-on-one -on -one tutor and other issues but we also um, help them understand the special need for our international students, uh, especially in some of the culture that is not really a plagiarism, but is a, is a habit to study. So we, on one hand, we educate our students um, the rules and regulation on our campus. On the other hand, we, um, we let our faculty know about um, their culture and their understanding, and so that they can meet in the middle. Um, we create a host family to um, integrate our students into American culture and local culture and all of this. But we also detect early um, and then learn early. So for example, um, be present, sometimes email, it's good, but then um, be a present for our students to let them know we're there to help. But at the same time, um, the new studies um, uh, indicate that for mental health and uh, other issues, not just 
um, among the social economic situations, less social economic situations. But now, there is a current study indicate that it happened. Uh, Eighty-two percent of those happened among the 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 rich family, and many of them parents are not even. No, fully love the students, their children's situation. So we have a red band watch. So all the students and roommates and and, and on campus have a responsibility to detect、uh, any symptom that、um, early, so that we can report and help the students. But that is a collective responsibility and effort.、Um, When students、uh, not showing in class, we all come miss a couple class. We ask, "How are you?" And、uh, and I said,、oh, "Life is too hard." And you know that those are symptoms. Those are the signs to reach out to them, and before it's too late.、Um, we、um, We we have a couple of situations、um, for when we spoke with、uh, Plagiarism. One of the students' um, um, family had some emergency, so she left, and then she called her roommate and said, "Can you take this final test for me? And it's my last test before I graduate. My grandma is in the hospital." Blah blah blah. And the roommate said, "No, we can't."、Um, Can so they back and say if you don't, I'll be, it'll be end of my life. Blah, blah. So the roommate said and took it, but did not realize that that was absolutely, absolutely、um, prohibited here in 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 our、um, our campuses. And、uh, so in that, we educate the students not only. Um, the rules regulation, but also to watch out for the signs and symptoms that our students have on campus,、um, and uh, also um, for for our、um, for our students, I also feel that we check on them、uh, in at the beginning, but in the middle of semester after midterm, we meet with them. And see, hear their joys and sorrows, and then understand their need. And then we、uh, return back to our meeting with on campus to advocate the need for the students. No matter more tutoring, more counseling, or more resources to help them, and that's ensure the.、Um, Our students to have the most positive experience, in addition to learn the,、um, the knowledge they need for the rest of their life. Now let's hear the、uh, the real story. Thank you. We we have such experience in this room. You know, as I look around the room, I know that everybody in different situations. Um, and that everybody, thank you. Everybody has faced at some point something that is so difficult. You just don't know if you have what you don't know if you have the structure, and you don't know if you have the wherewithal to try to sort something out. And I, I remember in my I, I've been in this profession now twenty years. My second year, I was teaching at a school, a public school in the Bronx, and one of my students passed away. This was the same year as nine eleven. So we went through 9/11, which was the second day of school that year, which is where the buildings. I had one student lose both parents that day, and then a couple of months later, I, I had a student who passed away. She had one of her lungs calcify, and one day she was there in class, and the next day that she wasn't. I was told before I walked into the class, 10 minutes ahead of the class, that it was my responsibility to help students. I was 22 years old at the time. I cried my way through that class. And I know that every single one of us, at some point, has faced something that we do not know how to manage. Our first response is to cry about it. I, I know you're all thinking in your mind, "Oh my gosh, I can think of that one moment where I just didn't know what to do." So it's like what Selena said. You know, we don't have time for crisis, but crisis certainly has time for us, and, and it finds us. And then suddenly, it. I think that that's almost the definition of a crisis. Is it's something that comes along that you. 
uh, as much as you can plan for, there are unintended things that happen that you just don't know what to, to do with. So we're going to talk a little bit about a case study, and I feel like Nepal has had a chair of crises with the earthquakes, the aftermath, and, and now something that happened last year, and it has to do with our space and admissions. And it's just a case study, and it it is about a couple of decisions that we made on the ground, which I really hope will help you the next time you face something like a student whose adopted parent decides to leave and the student is stuck in the country like New Zealand and uh, is trying to finish the last year of school. Maybe I know what you're talking, talking about. Um, so this is what happened. Same month, April, April 13, 2013, um, students across the fall, in the capital city, beyond, all the way to eastern Nepal, near the borders, got an email from a university. They had all gotten a full scholarship to this university. And on April 13th, uh, the UT Tyler at, in Texas sent them all an email saying, we're so sorry, but we will not be able to fulfill this full scholarship for you because of a budgetary error, an administrative error. Now, on paper, that just sounds um, very formal. It doesn't have an emotional tone to it, but I can tell you that for the students receiving this email, like I'm thinking of one student enrollment who saw this email, and it was the worst day of his life. It also happened to be the first day of the new year in Nepal. He didn't know what to do. He had told his parents he was going there. He was in the middle of the visa process. Um, his parents were really proud of him. It was going to be the first kid in the family who was going to college. He had been planning for this his entire life. He had taken a gap year to apply to the United States. And now, on the first year, the new year, he, he's thinking, wow, I don't, I went from having a full scholarship to having no college to go to because I've withdrawn from all my other schools. And so you want to multiply this by 61, 63 students. We, we are not sure of the number, but we know it's over 60. And then what happened was Selena Mala um, wrote, uh, and I think this is one thing that you can really take away from this presentation, is outreach. She wrote a very impassioned uh, email, a Facebook-based social media, calling on the um, higher ed community to support or help or, or just know about the situation. And it was a really compelling social media post. I am a big Facebook person, spent way too much time on Facebook, <laughs> and I saw this post, but I also received a phone call from a, a colleague in in um, Nepal, and this colleague said, oh, I have this case, I have this girl who, who said that her full scholarship was revoked, and I actually said to my colleague, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, a U.S. university would never do this, so either your, your student has read the email wrong, <laughs> or you have misinterpreted the situation. I told her she was wrong. And then a couple days later, April 22nd, I see this up on Facebook and I thought, oh my goodness, like, this is the truth. Actually, there has been a revocation. Kids are left without homes. Kids don't know where to go to college. And here's the thing. All of these kids were very high achieving kids, 14, 15 above, over 90 on the total. A's and A stars on their, um, on their curriculum. And in other words, they were they were some of the strongest students coming out of Nepal, and they went from being full scholarship students and overnight ha having nowhere to go. They, they also, some of them, given up some scholarships in Nepal. So this is Rupesh, and he was in the top 1% of test takers for the medical exam in Nepal. He had gotten a place at Nepal Institute of Engineering, which is like our MIT in the United States. He gave up that seat. He gave up that full scholarship seat. So um, this it hit the news. Uh, we tried to very hard in our outreach create some more visibility and amplify the situation through our outreach. And uh, many of the news articles in the United States focused a lot on um, the, the university, the system, and, and there were very few stories actually about the students. And I think part of that is because we're so far away from the United States. We're all these time zones away from the United States. Um, these are students that most Americans have, I mean, most Americans have never met somebody from Nepal. So this was very sort of far away, but it was really close to us here in this region. I mean, I think those of you who work in this region had heard about it um, in Singapore. It reached us very quickly. And 
So, okay. So we've established that there's a crisis. A crisis has found us, and um, what we then started to do was, uh, the kids had kind of, eight of them had gathered on this little Facebook page. And then we started to try to put out some more outreach to find more and more students. And then, as many of you know, we sent out this big email to the entire community and said, hey, if you have any seats left, if you have any financial aid left, you know, could you please contact us? And I will tell you what the crisis looked like on the ground. Okay, I'm going to be Singapore. <laughs> I've been to Nepal like maybe a couple of times. Selena's on the ground at HQ. She has all these kids coming to her center saying, I don't know what to do. What do I do? All right. Uh, Selena is also, as you would know, dealing with the 200, 300 students that are coming through the doors. And it's past April 1st. So you know, we all know what that time looks like in our offices. All right. So there's that going on. We're trying to verify the number of students. We, we are also trying to learn students' names. Oh my gosh, there's an Abishek. Wait a minute, there's another Abishek. Wait a minute, there's three Abisheks. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out the students. We have also this weird thing going on where a couple fraudulent students are coming forward because once seats start to happen, other students try to find us. Um, we are dealing with time zones. We're dealing with verification. Selena has people coming to her office to verify documents as quickly as possible so that we can get some more um, applications out to new universities. At the same time that we're trying to do that, we're trying to contact press. We're trying to do outreach to higher education institutions. We are trying to um, you know, gather all these students together and, and actually create a cohort. Because all of these kids, if you can imagine, they're on a ship. People tell 60 of you to get off. There's no more ships in sight. One ship comes along, and one seat from the university comes along, and now all 59 of you want this ship. It's like admissions hunger games on the ground. We're doing all of this through a couple of different tech platforms, and it is just, it's emotional. It's crazy. It's piecemeal. It's ad hoc. It is so chaotic. I, my stress level is like a 10 on a scale of 10. And it is just, it is a full blown crisis. And, and it, the reason why it's a crisis is because most of these kids are first generation. Going to college would change the trajectory of their entire family. So we are not actually just talking about 60 kids. We are talking about 60 families, 60 communities, 60 generations. I, I, I know this personally because my father uh, is from Taiwan. He was the first in his family to get a scholarship. Without that scholarship, he could not have gone to college. I would not have gone to the United States. I wouldn't actually be here. My life would have been entirely different. So while he was the scholarship recipient, I am the real beneficiary. And I thought, oh my gosh, and now we have 63 cases of this. Like one of these kids could be my dad. So the timing is very difficult because now we're past May 1st. Technically, this is when the US site was over. The scale is very difficult. 63 kids is, for some of us working in international schools, an entire graduating class. The scale, we first didn't know. I thought it was one person <laughs> in one case, and then I see Selena's email, and it's more. And then we find out it's 61, 63, um, the number we could never kind of get a hold of. Um, and then there's the money piece. So those of you who have ever tried to help a scholarship kid get full financial aid in the States, know that less than 1% of the market actually offers full financial aid. And then if you're in that 1% of the market, your chances are less than 1%. So for example, Lafayette University, they released their numbers uh, in a piece last year saying that they had 144 Nepali students apply for full scholarship. And that's just from one country. And one kid got it. There's another school that I'm not going to disclose in the Midwest, Middle Arts College, we have 600 kids applied for two seats, two full financial aid seats, uh, 600 kids from the continent, from the African continent. Your chances are two out of 600. Now, these aren't numbers that are published, but we know this working in this space. And so the odds are really, I guess in the Hunger Games, they say the odds are against you. So the odds are against you when it comes to the money and the, and, and the timing and the scale of the students and the situation. And so I'm just going to talk. I mean, we're now about a year and a half past this craziness. And 56 of the 60 kids um, went abroad and, and were able to get scholarships, about $10 million in scholarships, and were able to get seats and be seated. And they are now in countries, the United States, Canada, Qatar, Korea, Nepal. Um, but I want to talk about the crisis piece of this, which is the decisions that we made 
that I think can help you if you face an unprecedented situation. And the first one is the approach. I think that if we had said to ourselves, all of these kids have to get reseeded in America, that that would have been really an impossibility. It was already an impossibility, but to kind of be narrow in scope and say we're just going to be US centric and we seek the kids in America. I, I think that one thing that we did that, that now makes a lot more sense is that we said no, it's we're getting you to college. It doesn't matter what country. Like it is college or not, not which country. I mean, yes, the kids originally applied to the United States, but so we, the first thing that we did and the first decision that we made was we are going to have this be a global approach. We will approach this with caution, but through a global lens. And so the outreach was not just to the United States. The outreach was, it was to India, it was to New Zealand, it was, it was everywhere. It was anybody who had a seat. Because we knew that if a student left Nepal and still had access to higher education, they would still have access to global and social mobility. And that was really important. The second thing that we did, that what, that, and you can hear this in everything that we're saying actually, is it is, you know, reaching out to the Rotary Club, you know, getting host families, if you have got to build a team. It is, not, one should not be dealing with unprecedented things on their own in isolation. And even if you just reached out and said, hey, community, hey, my fellow counselors in Cambodia, like what is one thing that I can be doing here to advance this situation? So we had a call to higher education institutions, but we also had a call for volunteers. And some of you are sitting in this room, we came forward and you were pro bono counselors and we paired you with a, a student so that you could work with them individually. And so I, I really think that there is, even if it is a loose federation, that team is a loose federation of volunteer individuals, because all of us were doing this as volunteers, we all have day jobs, you know, it, it, it's still much better than one person trying to manage this on their own. So <coughs> outreach on a global scale, I think is helpful. Mobilization of a team is also helpful. The other thing is technology. I am now of the opinion that good counseling does not have to happen in person. I used to be. I, this is my job. This is what I paid for. But now I understand that a lot, the way the world is now, so much can be done well through platforms. We use four platforms to run this whole thing. WhatsApp, that was the core team of people who were leading this group, there are eight of us. We all used to WhatsApp. WhatsApp, WhatsApp, WhatsApp. We use Facebook for the students. We put all the kids on Facebook and they all gathered in the same space and they all could read all the information that was coming in on a daily basis. Oh, there's a new university that's come forward. You know, please read this post. Okay, we used Zoom. We bought a Zoom platform, which is a low cost platform actually, and we used it to put the kids together and have these in person meetings and in person powwows and tell them, okay, if you get a seat, you better withdraw immediately because. We, we've really got to shuttle this. We've got, we cannot just be having seats hanging here and there. Just sort of like the norms of the group. And uh, and then we use Concourse. So we had a platform come forward and say to us, hey, we will offer you our platform pro bono. And so, you know, can you imagine that a university comes forward and now 29 kids are applying to it, and then another university comes forward and then 13 kids are applying to it, and it's like this. It's all over the place. We don't have Common App at this point. <laughs> you know, this is a crisis. And so Concourse came forward, and Concourse is this platform that basically allows everybody to be in one centralized place, and then it allows all the higher ed institutions to be able to see the entire cohort of who's left. And I cannot tell you what a difference this made to all of us in terms of centralizing this crisis, because otherwise it just kind of feels like this constellation of moving pieces. And so as much as one can use tech, and we are so lucky, the tech that we have now is, we could, this, if this happened 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had these tools. But we were lucky to be able to do everything pretty much remotely, and pretty much with the tech at hand, very low cost, very, very low cost. And so, it's the outreach, it's the team, it's the tech. I would say that those are some things that really help us move this forward. And I, I guess I would also just say on, on a personal note, one, one thing that I recognized and realized through this, now that you can look at this in hindsight, 
is that it is not often institutions that move a crisis forward. It's an individual. Okay, it is somebody who cares at a university, who goes and fights with their president, and says, we've got to do something about this, please, can we just open up one seat? You know, it, it, and, and, and it really gave me an insight into how much power we all have bottom up. I think my entire life, I have been, in coming from the culture that I'm coming from, it's like, you know, wait for top-down decisions, wait for leadership to come forward, and, and in this particular case, you know, the associations that we were a part of were member associations, they weren't student associations, and so when we looked outward and tried to get help and tried to look at the various bodies that were sitting in this space, it wasn't going to be an association that took care of this, it was going to be individuals. And so I'm a real big believer that when a crisis happens, that if an individual cares enough to move something forward, that, that something can be moved forward, you know. And um, and so I just think that that's worth thinking about. I, my principal at school says that when the worst happens, a community's character is really shown in moments of when it is really bad. It, it's not just when we're having a party, right? It, it's when something happens to a member of the community, and how does that, how do the individuals in the community around that, that I mean, that, that is the real test. And so, um, I, I, I guess, I hope that this is, some of this has been useful to you, um, and that, that when, as you are facing unprecedented things in your own careers, in your own offices, in your own lives, that this maybe gives some ideas as to how to, to do some things to, to move it forward. And, and that was very much our goal. We were not initially like, we're going to get all 60 kids in. We just thought that was an impossibility. We just thought, what are we going to do to advance this forward? How do we advance this forward? How do we, each day, if we could just do a couple of small things to push this boulder up the hill, that eventually we would get to a, a much better place. And so in a way, our goal was a moving goalpost each day. So are there any insights you all want to add like on a personal or a professional? Um. What, what you shared with us for each one, that the role we play in our own institutions, um, it matters to us, matters to our students, it was the effort to advocate. Um, and it's very, it's very difficult to come up with a full funding, tuition, room and board, for students, especially in the middle of May, April, when our uh, scholarship and financial aid uh, already allocated, and our um, classrooms um, um, already set to contribute to the society and to the world, and both John and Selena changed under this team, changed with Nepali students. So many generations to come. And I think also educate ourselves on our campus and community how resilient they are and to be able to make a presence on our campus to educate us, make us humble and <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like to now open up for questions if anybody has any questions or comments. Um, about supporting students <coughs> in crisis, where we are having the last um, nine minutes of the campaign. Just a comment, really, that I guess the disappointment I had at the time was I, and it relates to something that Joan said, was that organizations didn't step up, it was individuals, and um, I was disappointed that I didn't really step up in the way that it might have, I think, but, but it really does come down to individuals, and you have to think that. That's what's so important with Jane said that it's reaching out to people then rather than reaching out to organizations. That's it. Yeah, and, and Kubi, if I don't if you don't mind, like I I know you had a like you don't mind when she Kubi has had Kubi wasn't even and I remember you had a senior that there was a couple of mm -hmm. and, and the lost responses that they were at the school is like um, sometimes you expect, you know, like the school, the community, like these two budget organizations to sort these things out, but really it comes down to like, your efforts, like the students saying individual efforts. And so so you know, I just think it's I just think it's something to think about. Maybe we'll fill in the comment. 
to be vocal and to, to hold them accountable for not taking action. I think one of the things that frustrated me so much about that entire situation is that had that happened to a U.S. cohort, a U.S. citizen cohort, uh, they would have had legal recourse. And international schools don't have that. And it is on us to protect them and to be vocal about really, I think, holding our, our membership organizations accountable for enforcing policies. Um, you know, that should have that should have never happened full out. And I think all of us feel that way. Um, but the students had no legal recourse to take. And so I do think it's on us as members to also be vocal. And that would be something that I would say it is it, I think all of us as individuals certainly have fought the fights that we need to fight to help as many students as we can, but we are limited. And so I think that as a group, we have a lot of power. So I think it's important for us to be able to come together and do it. Yeah, it's, it's a big, I, I feel like one thing I really learned from this whole thing is that a lot of other initiatives can be an example of top down initiatives. And I think that the world is starting to look at this But like when you watch some of the Facebook groups, so I don't know, there's a group called the Accept Group that I feel like is people here on Facebook group. We're starting to see uh, a lot more ground up, groundswell uh, organizations push larger institutions and larger institutions forward. And all this, you know, but there's now also an emphasis now at higher education institutions on social entrepreneurship. And those are also actually bottom up initiatives that are, are, are to move systemic issues that are challenging forward. So I, I don't know, I, I think we're all part of something larger. And, and thank you to the community for keeping the growing five years in Canada. So thank you to the community. Thank you very much.